Due to the graphic nature of this episode, listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Drift and Ramble podcast. I'm Steve Blizzen. Each episode will explore true stories and American legends. From the pages of history and a few stories handed down over the years, we'll look at the people, places, and events that helped shape a nation. Stories of survival, notable frontier men and women, explorers who struck it rich, and the outlaws that stole it from them. There'll be studies of saloon girls, swindlers, banditry, and bad men, profiles of lawmen and American Indians, and the good and evil that existed between them. We'll amble through the past, we'll delve into the folklore of the times, and maybe even uncover a ghost story or two. So, saddle up, or settle in, for the Drift and Ramble podcast. This is Episode 18. In the foothills of the Ozark Mountains of Arkansas, in newly formed Crawford County, was born a man who would become a legend. A man whose storied career in law enforcement was so impressive, he may have been the inspiration for one of the Old West's first fictional superheroes, the Lone Ranger. The man was born into slavery, but grew to become the first African-American deputy U.S. Marshal west of the Mississippi. His reputation for a successful arrest record was so well known among outlaws that some chose to turn themselves in rather than face him in a gunfight or have him track their trail. Bass Reeves became one of the most respected names in law enforcement and a legend in the history of the Old West. Born into slavery, his parents were owned by William Reeves, Bass quickly grew in both size and stature within the Reeves family. Taking his surname from his owners, as was a common practice for slaves, Bass would work to earn his keep. Graduating from water boy to field hand, Bass would soon become the personal companion of William's son, George Reeves. Bass developed his good manners and a sense of humor while growing to be over six feet tall. In a time when most men averaged five feet five inches, Bass was six foot two. Bass was tall even by today's standards. When young George Reeves joined the Texas Confederate Army and went into battle, he took Bass with him to fight. Bass was loyal to George Reeves, but he did not fear him. And allegedly, the two got into a fight over a card game. Bass knocked his owner out cold, and he fled. Because the penalty for such an offense was death. He crossed the Red River into Indian Territory and fell in with the Seminole and Creek tribes. Here, he learned invaluable skills like tracking, hunting, and communicating with local tribesmen in five different languages, and learning the lay of the land. He also spent considerable time working with his pistols, so much so he could shoot extremely well with either hand. Though he didn't consider himself to be an expert marksman with a rifle, his skills were exceptional. Eventually, his reputation as a crack shot was so well known, he was barred from entering local turkey shoot competitions. Though Bass was noted for carrying his guns in a number of ways, he preferred a pair of Colt revolvers chambered in 3840 caliber, which he often wore in reversed configuration, to enable a fast crosshand draw. His Winchester rifle was chambered in the same caliber as his pistols. With the passing of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, Bass became a free man. No longer a fugitive, he purchased some farmland near Van Buren, Arkansas, and he began to settle into his new life as a rancher and farmer. Within a year, 
he had married a woman named Nellie Jenny from Texas, and they began a family that would grow to be five girls and five boys. For nearly ten years, Bass stayed busy living a contented life with his wife and ten kids. But things were about to change again for the farmer and family man. On May 10, 1875, Isaac C. Parker was elected judge for the Federal Western District Court at Fort Smith, Arkansas. Parker was tasked with cleaning up the criminal element in the Indian Territory, which had become a haven for murderers, horse thieves, and bootleggers to hide out in because there was no federal or state jurisdiction. Add to these lawless renegades any number of African-American, Native American, and white outlaws who had fled to the area from Texas, Kansas, and other states in the Union. One of Judge Isaac Parker's first acts was to appoint Deputy U.S. Marshal James F. Fagan to hire and command a force of 200 deputies to bring law and order to the territory. Parker wanted to hire black deputies because whites were not trusted by Native Americans. So they reached out to Bass Reeves to become a deputy because he was African American and claimed to know the Indian Territory like a cook knows her kitchen. He could also speak several local Native American languages. About the only thing Bass couldn't do was read and write, but Bass didn't let a little thing like that stand in his way. At the time, it wasn't unheard of to find black lawmen working in the area. There were African-American freedmen living among all the five civilized tribes, and some of these men served as tribal police. Black deputies proved to be far more effective with Native Americans, and they were instrumental in gaining respect and developing a rapport, where whites were mostly ineffectual. Though many blacks were hired for these positions, Bass, again, was a standout among the new recruits. Aside from his extensive knowledge of the area and local tribes, he had some prior experience working with law enforcement as both a scout and a tracker, too. Bass took up the challenge to become a deputy U.S. Marshal, and it's possible history was made. Bass Reeves is believed to have been the first African-American deputy U.S. Marshal west of the Mississippi, and he served longer than any other deputy U.S. Marshal on record in Indian Territory. During his 35-year career, he earned a reputation as one of the best deputy U.S. Marshals to work out of the Fort Smith Federal Court. But Reeves was not alone in developing a legendary status out of his Fort Smith career. He was joined by the likes of Judge Isaac Parker, Heck Thomas, Grant Johnson, Bud Ledbetter, Heck Bruner, and Bill Tillman. The famous gunfighter Bat Masterson wrote about in 1907. Masterson's story about Bill Tillman is featured in an exclusive episode available only for Patreon supporters of the Drift and Ramble podcast. While much of the documentation of Mr. Reeves' personal history is spotty at best, a rich oral history, combined with other documents and stories, was assembled by author Art T. Burton that provides us with a glimpse into the life and times of this legendary lawman. The resulting work culminated in a book by Mr. Burton titled Black Gun, Silver Star, The Life and Legend of Frontier Marshal Bass Reeves, Race and Ethnicity in the American West. And it's a fascinating story. The Indian and Oklahoma territories where Bass Reeves served were some of the most dangerous for law enforcement at the time. The Twin Territories, as they were commonly called, cost the lives of more than 120 deputy U.S. Marshals, far and away the most deadly territory for deputy U.S. Marshals to work. Bass Reeves is said to have made some 3,000 arrests over his 35-year career. It is believed he shot and killed 14 men. And although he was shot at on numerous occasions, and even had his horse shot out from under him a time or two, he never suffered any serious wounds in a gunfight. He earned plenty of bullet holes in his clothes, boot heels, and even had his hat shot off his head. But the man himself went mostly unscathed. Some folks think he had a destiny, and until he reached it, the man was invincible. 
like this was a common belief among Native American peoples. Perhaps Bass himself believed this too. Reeves was often described as a champion for animals, and stories abound about his disgust over the mistreatment of pets or livestock. In one story, Bass came upon a group of cowboys preparing to dispatch a stranded steer. The animal had become stuck in the muddy bogs around Mud Creek, where it joined the Red River in the southern part of the Chickasaw Nation. A full-grown steer can weigh about 1,500 pounds, and this animal had sunk so deep that only its head and a portion of its back remained above the water. The cowboys had roped its neck and tried dragging it onto dry land, but the animal wouldn't budge. The steer's breathing was restricted by the ropes. The stress of the animal's situation had taken its toll. It labored for breath beneath the tight ropes around its neck. Its eyes rolled back, and its tongue rolled out of its mouth into the mud. As Bass arrived, the men were preparing to shoot the animal and leave. Disgusted by the scene, Bass quietly dismounted, stripped off his clothes, and stepped into the water without saying a word. Bass first removed the ropes around the animal's neck so it could breathe. Then he grabbed the steer by its horns and began to speak and hum to it in a soft, low tone. Hey, mister, that steer's a goner. You best be careful that animal don't drag you under. Stranger, we done tried everything to free him. I reckon you're wasting your time. Oh, you look mighty stuck to me. We're gonna get you out of here. Don't you worry. He worked the animal's head and legs, lifting it slowly and methodically out of the mud. Mm. We're much obliged, mister, but we can't be fooling with this animal all day. Uh. Reeves grunted and moaned as he sank into the mud himself, working to free the animal. And it finally strode up out of the bogs and off into the trees. Yeah. <laughs> now ain't that some? That old steer ain't got no manners. You could say thank you. Hey, mister, you sure saved our day. What's your name? Reeves. Bass Reeves. Deputy U.S. Marshal. You're that fella I heard tell about. As good with a pistol as you are a rifle, they say. Pleasure to meet you, Mr. Reeves. Smart, tough, honorable, and intelligent, Mr. Reeves could not read or write. This proved to be a challenge in his law enforcement career, but Mr. Reeves never let a little thing like that get in the way of his work. He devised a way to work around his own illiteracy by using memorization and enlisting the help of any local with those skills. In the area around Oklahoma, many families still have stories about Bass Reeves. One such story, as described in Mr. Burton's book, comes from Sandy Sturdivant, who, as a young girl, heard this memorable story about Bass Reeves. On one occasion, down in the Choctaw Nation near Robbers Cave, Bass Reeves and his posse had stopped for the night and made camp. They had been rounding up felons and were on their way back to Fort Smith with a contingent of prisoners. After dinner, when everyone was asleep, a skunk crawled up around Reeves. Now, some skunks don't carry odor around themselves unless they're riled up. Well, when Bass awoke, the skunk was curled up, blissfully sleeping next to him. One of the prisoners woke up at the same time and proceeded to yell and carry on, trying to rouse the skunk into doing something obnoxious. Bass reached over, gently stroked the animal, and talked soothingly to it, whereupon it moseyed off without spraying anyone. The Reeves charm had won out again. Another story told by Miss Sturdivant's grandmother was about how fearless Bass was. This one takes place near Ulaga in the Cherokee Nation. Bass Reeves was afraid of no man. It was like he had a destiny, and until that destiny was fulfilled, he was invincible. While out making his rounds, Reeves came across a lynch mob near one of the large cattle ranches. Evidently, a rustler had been caught and was about to be strung up to a tree by a group of cowboys. Without any thought of the danger he might be in, Reeves rode straight up to the lynch mob, cut the man down with his knife, and rode off with the man, without saying one word to anyone. 
It so astonished everyone that he was not pursued. In the 1950s, a man named Richard Fronterhouse interviewed residents of Oklahoma about Bass Reeves. One of the stories he got went like this. Bass Reeves' ability with firearms was legendary. He was ambidextrous with a pistol or a rifle. He never carried silver or nickel-plated pistols with ivory or pearl handles. He preferred his firearms to be plain, ordinary, inconspicuous. Reeves was possibly the greatest gunfighter of all the lawmen of the Old West. He could shoot so well and so consistently that he was barred regularly from competition in turkey shoots that were common to the local fairs and picnics of Indian Territory. I was told that a turkey shoot in the Seminole Nation consisted of tying a turkey upside down to a clothesline, after which a rider with a rifle would attempt to shoot the head off the turkey while galloping full speed down the line. Reeves' speed with the pistol has been likened to that of a Methodist preacher reaching for a platter of fried chicken during Sunday dinner at the deacon's house. One early Indian Territory pioneer said, Bass Reeves was a very big man told jokes, was boastful and lusty, full of life, and wore a large black hat. He had a deep and resonant voice that could be very authoritative when it had to be, but assuring just the same. Reeves' laugh was thunderous and booming. Due to his size, he always rode a large horse. Bass said, When you get as big as me, a small horse is as worthless as a preacher in a whiskey joint fight. Just when you need him bad to help you out, He's got to stop and think about it a little bit. Reeves rode mostly bay, sorrel, and gray horses when he made trips into the Indian nations. Bass quickly became legendary for his crime-fighting skills. A deputy was allowed to travel with a cook, a guard, and a posse man. A wagon, often called a tumbleweed wagon, would serve as a supply depot for the men and prisoners, as well as sort of a rolling prison. Outlaws were rounded up and chained to the tumbleweed wagon, while the deputy used the wagon as a base of his operations. He could ride off and round up as many as 30 men for each 30-day outing, and fees were paid accordingly. It wasn't unusual for two marshals to ride out together, split up, go round up their quarry, and then meet up again with the wagon and drive all their prisoners back to Fort Smith. Bass himself claimed to never make a 30-day trip for less than $400, and several incidents point to Bass making substantially more. In one case, he captured 17 prisoners in Comanche County, and he delivered them to court at Fort Smith. Bass was paid $900 for that trip. The courthouse at Fort Smith was a machine, and it ran nearly nonstop. Judge Parker kept his courtroom open six days a week, from 7.30 in the morning until 6 p.m. at night, with a merciful one-hour lunch in between. In the 21 years between May 10, 1875, when he first began his post at Fort Smith, until September of 1896, Judge Parker tried 13,940 cases, with better than half of those resulting in a conviction. Just about one out of every 100 cases was a guilty conviction ending up with the death penalty. The rest had a prison sentence waiting that could last anywhere from one to 45 years. Judge Parker's epic anti-crime wave was based on a simple premise. The certainty of punishment, rather than the punishment itself, was the only way to combat crime. Though Parker sentenced 160 men to die by the gallows, only 79 were actually hanged. Of those 79, an interesting demographic breakdown is revealed. 23 were African American, 26 were Native American, and the remaining 30 were white. Still, Judge Isaac Parker became known throughout the territory as the Hanging Judge, and there was no appealing his decisions, at least not until 1889. The Indian Territory had its own well-respected police force, known as the Light Horse Police. But treaties in place at the time prevented the arrest of any criminal who was not a citizen of the Indian nations. This loophole attracted some of the most notorious outlaws in the West to
to come and hide out in the Indian Territory. It was the deputy U.S. marshals from Fort Smith who were tasked with reining in these dangerous men. And for those of you keeping score at home, here's some interesting demographics. In 1888, the U.S. Attorney General estimated that out of the 20,000 white people thought to be living in Indian Territory, only 5,000 were thought to be law-abiding. For every 11 men convicted at the Fort Smith Federal Court, seven were white, three were African American, and only one was Native American. Still, Bass Reeves was up against some of the toughest desperados the American West would ever know and the outlaws knew that if they were caught, they might end up in front of hanging Judge Parker. Bass was fearless with these men, but he was also clever and resourceful. Some of the men Bass sought to bring in were tribal leaders, respected elders of the Indian nations, and some were medicine men, conjurers alleged to possess supernatural powers. One such man was a Creek prophet and conjurer named Yaqui. In the following excerpt from the book Indian Territory by D.C. Gideon, published in 1901, the author recounts a story told to him by Bass Reeves himself. Among the numerous deputy marshals that have ridden for the Paris, Texas, Fort Smith, Arkansas, and Indian Territory courts, none have met with more hairbreadth escapes or effected more hazardous arrests than Bass Reeves of Muskogee. Bass is a stalwart Negro, 50 years of age, weighs 180 pounds, stands 6 feet and 2 inches in his stockings, and fears nothing that moves or breathes. His long muscular arms have attached to them a pair of hands that would do credit to a giant, and they handle a revolver with the ease and grace acquired only after years of practice. Several bad men have gone to their long homes for refusing to halt when commanded to by Bass. But we will let him tell a story of adventure in his own words. Bass Reeves, the invincible Deputy United States Marshal, related to this writer, an instance of the supernatural power at one time exerted over himself by Ya Key, who made his abode on the North Fork. I was up there to arrest a lot of men for horse theft and had two wagon loads of prisoners encamped in the woods in care of my posse. Among them were two Indians who had each made Yaqui a present of a pony from medicine the old man had furnished them, guaranteed to render them invisible should the officers attempt to serve a warrant upon them for horse theft. As I also had a warrant for Yaqui, I went back and got him too. And when we were camped for the night, I was feeling very stiff and sore, although having felt well all the day. We started for Fort Smith the next morning, and although I rode a good saddle horse, I was unable to keep within sight of the wagons. When I reached their camp at noon, they were done eating, and the prisoners shackled together were lying under the trees asleep. With the greatest difficulty, I dismounted and fell forward against a tree aching in every limb. My eyes were so swollen I could scarcely see. I could eat nothing and seemed possessed of a consuming thirst. Believing that old Yaqui had bewitched me, I felt that all hope was gone. My knees refused to bear the weight of my body, and feeling that my last hour had come, I thought I'd take a last look upon the man who I felt was responsible for my present condition. He was lying on his back, asleep, and his coat had turned partially over so that a concealed inner pocket was brought into view. I saw a string dangling from it. It made up my mind that it was attached to his conjure bag. Gently, I dragged myself to his side, and with a jerk, drew from his pocket a moleskin bag filled with bits of roots, pebbles, and tiny rolls of short hair tied with blue and red strings. I tossed it as far as I could and saw it float away on the bosom of a creek that flowed alongside the camp. With a start, Yaqui awoke. Bass, he said, you stole my conjure bag. Yes, I did, I said, and now it is sailing down the creek. 
The old man promised all kinds of pay if I would return it, but I feared it less as it sailed down the creek than when it was in the hands of Yaqui. I can't conjure any more, said the old man. My power is gone. Take off this chain, and I will follow you like a dog. I declined to do this, however, and the prisoners started on. From the moment the bag touched the water, I began to feel relieved. I later mounted my horse, and when I caught up with the party in the evening, I felt as well as ever. Ya Ki told me that afterward, if he had not lost his conjure bag, I would have been dead before they reached Fort Smith. And I believe it, too. This was the last time Ya Ki ever tried to exert his power for evil over any person and thereafter refused to practice the black art. Bass was credited with arresting 3,000 outlaws. His tactics changed to meet whatever challenge lay before him, and he was also a master of disguise. He would blend in to fit the situation, often appearing to be a lowly drifter or tribesman, outfitted with a bedraggled old horse. Being naturally tall in the saddle and easily recognizable, Bass learned to appear small from a distance, so his capturers could not easily identify him from afar. His calm, friendly, unassuming demeanor masked his true intent, and he'd often joke around with his intended targets before making an arrest. But it didn't always go smoothly. In one instance, Reeves was sent to arrest a ranch foreman named Jim Webb. Webb was ill-tempered, and used to settling his arguments with fists or a gun. The ranch he worked was bordered by a smaller ranch owned by Reverend William Stewart. Reverend Stewart, an African-American preacher, set a small grass fire on his property one day in early spring of 1883, and the fire quickly spread onto the neighboring ranch. Jim Webb immediately exploded and went to confront the preacher next door. The argument got heated and ended with Webb shooting the good reverend dead. Reeves took posseman Floyd Wilson with him to make the arrest. They rode up to the ranch house early one morning, a few days after the event. Wilson spotted two men on the porch, and Reeves hatched a plan hoping to avoid any gunfire. Pretending they were a pair of cowboys just passing through, Reeves and his posse man rode up nice and easy and asked the two ranchers for breakfast. Jim Webb and Frank Smith were suspicious, and they kept their guns in their hands, but their arms at their sides. Reeves and Wilson were invited into the kitchen and were told to wait while the cook prepared breakfast. Reeves sensed that Webb was still suspicious, and he tried to assuage Webb's fears by asking if he could go feed his horse while the food was cooking. Webb agreed, but followed Reeves out to the barn. There, there. Reeves continued there, to speak there, in there. his low, calm tone while he loosened the saddle and girths, fed the horse, and casually removed his rifle and leaned it against a nearby corn crib. Easy now. He wanted to convince Webb he was just passing through, and for a moment, he thought he was successful. But when the men returned to the house, Webb and Smith began to whisper and gesture in the direction of Reeves and Wilson, and Reeves knew the wanted man was still suspicious of him and his posseman. Reeves thought he might be able to somehow signal to Wilson to take action, but Webb wouldn't take his eyes off Reeves, so signaling a coordinated attack wasn't possible. Reeves continued blathering on about nothing until something drew the wanted man's attention away. In one swift action, he leapt to his feet and knocked Webb's gun away with his large left hand, wrapping his hand around Webb's throat. With his right hand, he swiftly drew his pistol and shoved it into Webb's face. Though Webb gurgled out a surrender, Reeves' partner was so stunned by the swiftness of Reeves' attack that he made no attempt to subdue Frank Smith. Smith now seized the opportunity to fire two shots at Reeves, but he missed with each shot. Reeves kept his left hand tightly gripped around Webb's neck and trained his pistol on Smith, firing once and dropping Smith to the ground. Reeves then ordered Wilson to put handcuffs on Webb. The two prisoners were taken to Fort Smith. 
Along the way, Frank Smith died from his wounds. Webb was jailed, but Reeves and Webb would meet again. After spending nearly a year in jail, Webb's friends managed to have him released on bond. They raised $17,000 in bond money for him, and he disappeared. When the murder trial was finally about to start, Webb was long gone. Reeves got word that Webb could be found at Jim Bywater's general store, located on the south side of the Arbuckle Mountains in the Chickasaw Nation. This area is known today as Woodford, Oklahoma. Reeves took posse man John Cantrell with him. He sent Cantrell up ahead to look for Webb, and sure enough, he spotted Webb sitting by a window in the store. Cantrell signaled Reeves to come up, but Webb spotted the big black marshal on his horse, and Webb dove out the window and ran for his horse. Webb was armed with his pistol and his Winchester rifle, but Reeves cut him off before he could reach his horse. Webb changed course and ran for some brush a few hundred yards away. As he ran, he turned and fired at Reeves, with the first shot grazing the horn of Reeves' saddle. A second shot cut a button off Reeves' coat. The third shot Webb fired sliced through both bridle reins just below Reeves' hand and they fell to the ground. Reeves jumped off his horse, and as he did, a fourth bullet pierced through the brim of his hat. Reeves fired back, and before Webb could fall, Reeves had sent two rounds into Webb from his Winchester rifle. The store owner, Mr. Bywaters, and Reeves' posse man, John Cantrell, came running up to find Webb on the ground with his pistol still in his hand, calling out for Bass Reeves to come to him. The story, as it appears in Mr. Gideon's 1901 book, Indian Territory, continues as follows. Reeves advanced, but while keeping his gun trained on him, told Webb to throw the revolver away. He flung it into the grass out of his reach, and the whole party walked up to the dying man. Give me your hand, Bass said Webb, as he extended his own with an effort to grasp it. You're a brave man, and I want you to accept my revolver and scabbard as a present, and you must accept them. Take it, for with it I have killed eleven men, four of them in Indian territory, and I expected you to make the twelfth. Bass accepted the present and has it now carefully stored away. The dying declaration of Webb was taken in writing by Mr. Bywaters, and thus ended the career of another bad man. Years later, in 1907, during a newspaper interview, Bass made the following statement. The bravest man I ever saw was Jim Webb, a Mexican that I killed in 1884 near Sacred Heart Mission. He was a murderer. I got between him and his horse. He stepped out into the open about 500 yards away and commenced to shoot in his Winchester. Before I could drop off my horse, his first bullet cut a button off my coat, and a second cut my bridle rein in two. I shifted my six-shooter and grabbed my Winchester and shot twice. He dropped, and when I picked him up, I found that two of my bullets had struck within a half inch of each other. He shot four times, and every time he shot, he kept running closer to me. He was 500 yards away from me when I killed him. But was Jim Webb really Mexican, as Bass Reeves had stated in his interview? Author Art Burton posits that Reeves faced other serious challenges in addition to the physical demands of crime fighting, not the least of which was racism. Reeves may have stated that Webb was a Mexican to eschew any blowback from whites for the killing of the man. Bass Reeves was a deputy U.S. Marshal with the authority to arrest white men for crimes committed against African Americans, Native Americans, and whites. Reeves faced men charged with lynching Negroes on a regular basis. He also faced biased press, law enforcement, and court personnel who often minimized or neglected Bass Reeves' contributions to arrests. Reeves himself was very much aware of the stigma and resentment 
held by the white men he arrested. In one instance, Reeves, dealing with a man thought to be a white outlaw, he quietly told the suspect to turn in his guns to a white store owner rather than surrender the guns to Reeves, thus diffusing any embarrassment caused by the racial tensions of the time. Another challenge for Reeves was lack of formal education. His signature was an X. If he had to write, he first had to find someone who could write, then dictate to them. Things only got more complicated when he had multiple subpoenas to serve, because most people he was serving could not read or write either. Reeves would study the subpoenas until he could match the symbols to the sound of someone's name. He would memorize these symbols or have someone read them to him so he could remember them. He would find the person answering to a particular name and serve the subpoena to them and tell them to read it. If the person could read, he was done. But if the person couldn't read, as was more often the case, Reeves would have to go find someone to read it for both of them. This could mean riding for a hundred miles before locating someone who could read. And perhaps laughingly, Reeves just seemed to have bad luck with the weather. The weather seemed to turn whenever Reeves was sent out to serve subpoenas. He even joked about it with other deputies, warning them, Get ready for bad weather, boys. I got a stack of subpoenas to serve, so Mother Nature is bound to go crazy. Hope I don't drown or freeze before I get back. Despite all of the challenges he faced, he served all of the subpoenas he was issued and took pride in the fact that he never made a mistake of serving the wrong person. Many of the courts he rode for specifically requested Reeves because of this reputation for dependability. And dependable, he was. Despite being charged with the shooting death of his own cook, Reeves was dependable, but he was not without controversy. In a few instances, Reeves was alleged to have let men go for the right price, and at one point, he may have been relieved of duty. There are also stories of him racing his horse against the horse of wanted men for the prize of freedom if the wanted man's horse won. But if Reeves was relieved of duty and investigated, he must have resumed his duties quickly. The timing of these allegations was curious, too. These allegations began to surface shortly after an incident in which Reeves killed his cook. In April of 1884, Reeves was camped with his cook, a man named Leach, and several prisoners on their way to Fort Smith. The cook had a dog, and after dinner, the dog was getting into the pots and pans. Reeves, meanwhile, was attempting to remove a shell case from his rifle when the gun went off. The bullet struck the cook near the neck, and he died a short time later. Though Bass was charged with murder, the case didn't go to trial until two years later. Witnesses to the shooting were mostly prisoners, and court testimony showed that an argument about the dog had taken place just before the shooting. According to Bass Reeves' own testimony, however, the shooting was accidental. Ultimately, Bass was acquitted of all charges, but not before he had spent six months in jail and had to sell his home. Bass had to sell his house to pay legal fees, and he never fully recovered from the financial strain of the trial. Reeves was eventually reinstated, however, although it's unclear exactly when. Once he was restored to his official capacity, he quickly resumed his exemplary career. In June of 1902, another tragic turn of events would test the resolve of Mr. Reeves. This time, he was tasked with serving an arrest warrant for his own son, Ben. Benny Reeves had blamed himself for his wife's first known act of adultery. When he caught his wife in bed with another man, he reasoned that his job and the traveling it required was to blame. Benny Reeves sought to make changes to his lifestyle, and he reconciled with his wife. One night shortly thereafter, he spoke with his father, Bass, about the indiscretion. He asked his father, What would you have done, Daddy? His father's reply was simple. I would have shot the hell out of that man and beat the living God out of her. Soon after this father and son chat, Benny came home and found his wife in bed again with another man. 
This time, he beat up and bloodied the man, who made a hasty escape. And with his blood still boiling over the infidelity, he shot his poor wife to death. None of the deputies in the area wanted to serve a warrant on Bass Reeves' own son. So it sat at the court desk for two days before Bass himself volunteered to serve the warrant. He calmly and methodically arrested his own son for the act of murder. Though he showed no preferential treatment, he did, however, stay with his son throughout his proceeding and until he was sentenced and transferred to Leavenworth Prison. Ben became a model citizen while in jail, and he was eventually released, in part because of his father's reputation and also because of his own exemplary personal conduct while in jail. Reeves was back at work as a deputy U.S. marshal when he was almost killed over a stolen pig. Reeves' daughter, Alice Spann, relayed the story. The pig had been reported stolen, and my father went to speak to the primary suspect. Arriving early in the morning, Daddy found the man cleaning up and spotted hog hair near the fireplace. Daddy had breakfast with the man, then told him of his arrest warrant. He told the man the court would treat him favorably if he gave up the names and whereabouts of his accomplices, and the man complied. Daddy took the first man with him and retrieved two more suspects, chaining the men together in his wagon. But when he was approaching the fourth and final suspect, however, a shot rang out from some trees along the roadside. Daddy told the three men in the wagon to be quiet. Another shot rang out and Daddy fell on his side, drawing his pistol in the process. When a figure stepped out from the trees, Daddy shot the man in the stomach and took his fourth man into custody. Bass was said to have never been seriously wounded in all of the shootouts and assassination attempts made on him, but he may have been wounded at least once. Bass most likely transferred to the Paris, Texas court in 1893. Here, he would patrol the dangerous saloon towns of Pottawatomie County in Oklahoma Territory. Colonel Charles W. Mooney, who grew up in the area, had several stories about Bass Reeves. Mooney wrote about his father, Dr. Jesse, who knew Bass Reeves personally. Reeves had been shot in the leg and was calling for Dr. Jesse. Belle Starr told the doctor that she knew Bass Reeves and trusted him, which was a mighty unusual thing. Bell Starr had grown up with Jesse James and Cole Younger and was alleged to have been a Confederate spy during the Civil War. If being a white female outlaw wasn't unusual enough, being a Confederate sympathizer on friendly terms with a Negro was. But this particular man happened to be a deputy U.S. marshal to boot. When the doctor arrived, he found Bass in a saloon near the body of another man with a gun still present in the dead man's hand. The doctor treated the leg wound and asked what happened. Just another young gunslinger who doubted my ability with these six guns. He was real fast, but he couldn't shoot both fast and straight. The doctor finished his work, but refused to charge Bass the usual and customary $3 because they had been friends for eight years and because Bass was friends with Bell Star. Bell Star had her own notorious reputation. She married a Cherokee man named Sam Star in 1880, and the family settled in the Indian Territory. Bell took up aiding in criminal enterprises like helping outlaws hide, fencing stolen goods, and helping to plan crimes. She was known to be a crack shot, and she liked to carry two pistols hidden away in her always fashionable attire, just like Bass Reeves did. Mooney claims that in 1885, Reeves and Bell Starr both started wearing their pistols with the butts facing outward for a faster cross-hand draw. It's certain the two were aware of each other. On September 11, 1885, Reeves swore out a warrant for Bell Star and a man named Fayette Barnett. The two were wanted for horse thievery. Some say that Bell Star was so afraid of Bass that she turned herself in. Whether Star did it out of fear or respect, we may never know. But she did turn herself in to federal authorities. 
This was the one and only time Belle Starr turned herself in during all of her criminal career. It's not clear when Bass Reeves separated from his first wife, but the two rarely saw each other. With Bass being gone for weeks at a time, the marriage was bound to suffer. Liquor was a major problem in the Indian Territory. Men knew they couldn't get it, and they went to great lengths to smuggle, sell, or trade for alcohol. In his book, titled Localized History of Pottawatomie County, Oklahoma to 1907, Colonel Charles W. Mooney wrote that the modern term bootlegging came from the drovers, cowboys, and ranchers who would sneak a flat bottle of whiskey in each of their boots and smuggle it back into dry Indian territory. There were no legal liquor sales in this region. Others were bold and tied their bottles and jugs on their saddle horns under cover of darkness, sometimes swimming the river when it was swollen. The term last chance was coined here at these saloons, as it was on the border that they had their last chance to get liquor before going into dry Indian territory. In a newspaper article pertaining to Bass Reeves, Mooney wrote, Perhaps the most famous and best remembered of all the disguises, guises, and accomplishments of the fearless early day marshal was the time he dressed as a farmer. He drove through Keokuk Falls, then east of town in the Creek Nation. The cunning and sagacious officer had received a tip that some outlaws were holed up in an abandoned log cabin about a mile east of Keokuk. Driving a yoke of flea-bitten, aged oxen hitched to a ramshackle wagon of outdated vintage and usage, he slowly lumbered along, approaching the half-hidden cabin in a cluster of trees. Driving close to the cabin, he deliberately got the wagon hung up on a large tree stump. When the unsuspecting outlaws came out to get him free so he could be on his way and leave the quietude of their hideout, Old Bass calmly reached into his faded and patched overalls pockets and came out with his two big 45 caliber six-shooters and got the drop on the careless outlaws. None challenged that authority. He then disarmed all of them, gathered their weapons in the wagon, and marched all six of them in front of his wagon on foot to the county jail at Tecumseh, a distance of over 30 miles. There they were properly jailed by Sheriff Billy Truesdale and later taken to the federal jail at Guthrie where they were convicted of robbery of the Wawoka Trading Post, then owned by Governor John F. Brown of the Seminole Nation. Though Reeves had become well known around the Indian Territory, he did not dabble in fame. He was focused on police work and transitioned to a more urban routine. In January of 1900, Bass married Winnie J. Sumner, she was a Cherokee freedwoman and had been previously married. He had begun working in Muskogee and was no longer going on long trips into difficult terrain to catch bad guys. Bass may have transitioned to a more civilized beat around the town of Muskogee, but he still had a knack for making arrests. During the time he was working there, he primarily focused on arresting Native and African American felons. Though he still arrested whites when necessary, racial tensions were high and conflicts were taking place. This story, as relayed by Reeves' daughter, Alice Spann, to Richard Fronthauser, describes the sentiment at the time. This story also involved the letter trick used by Bass Reeves. There were these two men from Texas who were wanted for murder. One was a big man, one was a little man. Daddy had a warrant for their arrest. The Texans met him face to face on the road. Morning, gentlemen. I don't speak to black niggers. Hey, ain't you Bass Reeves? No. The Texans pulled their guns on Daddy and told him they would ride along until they met somebody who knew him. They rode quite a distance, but didn't meet anybody. The Texans finally said, Get down from your horse because we're going to kill you. My father told them he had a letter from his wife and asked if they would read it to him. He got down off his horse and got the letter out of his saddlebags. The two Texans also dismounted. With a shaking hand, Daddy handed the letter to the big man. The Texan said, What difference does it make? But when the big Texan took his eyes off my father and looked at the letter, which had been placed in the pommel of the saddle, Daddy grabbed the big man's neck in a death grip with one hand and said, Son of a bitch, now you're under arrest. With his other hand, he took the gun away. The little Texan was so scared, he dropped his gun. Daddy secured both men and took them to Muskogee. 
On November 16, 1907, Bass Reeves had his photograph taken with what the newspapers of the time called the First Federal Family. It was their last official act. The duties of the U.S. Marshals were divvied up among the various municipalities and counties in the newly formed state of Oklahoma. A large force of federal police was no longer needed. Bass, well into his 70s, was out of a job. There would not be another African-American deputy U.S. Marshal until the late 20th century. Once Oklahoma became a state, black men could only become Negro police and only arrest blacks in towns where there was a large black population. Bass was not unemployed long. Soon, he was walking a beat in Muskogee. He walked with a cane until November of 1909, when his health failed and he had become gravely ill. Reeves was forced to stop working. He died January 10th, 1910. When Bass died, he was honored by a number of local newspaper articles. In the following excerpts from the Muskogee Phoenix, from these articles that appeared after his death, you get a sense of the respect and admiration the man had achieved in his lifetime. While the articles reflect the sentiment of racial feelings at that time, for an African-American to receive this kind of press coverage was highly unusual. In the history of the early days of Eastern Oklahoma, the name of Bass Reeves has a place in the front rank among those who cleaned out the old Indian territory of outlaws and desperados. No story of the conflict of government officers with outlaws, which ended only a few years ago with the rapid filling of the territory with people, can be complete without mentioning of the Negro who died yesterday. For 32 years, beginning way back in the 70s and ending in 1907, Bass Reeves was a deputy United States Marshal. During that time, he was sent to arrest some of the most desperate characters that ever infested Indian territory and endangered life and peace in its borders. And he got his man as often as any of the deputies. At times, he was unable to get them alive, and so in the course of his long service, he killed 14 men. Bass Reeves, Negro, was buried yesterday and the funeral was attended by a large number of white people. Men, who in the early days knew the deputy marshal and admired him as a faithful officer and respected him as an honest man. Bass Reeves was a unique character. Absolutely fearless and knowing no master but duty, the placing of a writ in his hands for service meant that the letter of the law would be fulfilled though his life paid the penalty. In the carrying out of his orders during his 32 years as Deputy United States Marshal in the old Indian Territory days, Bass Reeves faced death a hundred times. Many desperate characters sought his life, yet the old man, even on the brink of the grave, went along the pathway of duty with the simple faith that some men have who believe that they are in the care of special providence when they are doing right. The arrest of his own son for wife murder, for which crime the young man is now serving a life sentence, is best illustration of the old deputy's Spartan character. Bass is dead. He was buried with high honors and his name will be recorded in the archives of the court as a faithful servant of the law and a brave officer. And it was fitting that such recognition was bestowed upon this man. It is fitting that, black or white, our people have the manhood to recognize character and faithfulness to duty. And it is lamentable that we as white people must go to this poor, simple old Negro to learn a lesson in courage honesty, and faithfulness to official duty. As stated in that article, and in other territorial newspapers of the Times, Reeves was said to have killed 14 men in the line of duty. Though there is no way to verify this number, because records of shootings simply were not maintained, there is also no doubt that Reeves survived more than his share of dangerous encounters. Based on the records we do have, and the experiences relayed by those who knew the man, it's possible that 14 is too low a number. But even if we accept that number as fact, that would mean that Bass Reeves killed more outlaws while performing his duties than any other lawman of that era. As Art Burton states in his book, this 
would make Bass Reeves the preeminent gunfighter of any Old West lawman on record. In 1992, Bass Reeves became the first African American inducted into the Hall of Great Westerners at the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum in Oklahoma. At the beginning of our show, I mentioned that Bass may have been the inspiration for the fictional star of radio and later television serials, The Lone Ranger. While it might be impossible to prove that claim definitively, there are some similarities that are worth noting. Federal law mandated that deputy U.S. marshals take at least one posse man with them while out on the trail of outlaws. Often, the men who assisted Bass Reeves were Native Americans just like the fictional character Tonto from The Lone Ranger. Reeves often worked in disguise, while The Lone Ranger wore a mask. Many of the white settlers in the territory didn't know Bass Reeves by name. They only knew him as that Black Marshal, which is similar to The Lone Ranger's mysterious identity. Several stories about Bass Reeves have him handing out a silver dollar as kind of a calling card or thank you. The Lone Ranger had the silver bullet. The Lone Ranger rode a white horse. Reeves was known to have gray horses, which can appear white. And finally, the story of the Lone Ranger was first developed and aired in Detroit, Michigan in 1933. Many of the fugitives Bass brought to Fort Smith were convicted and sent to the Detroit House of Corrections in Michigan. Impossible as it may be to prove that Bass Reeves was the inspiration for the Lone Ranger, the similarities are uncanny. Many different articles and resources were used in researching this story. Although every effort has been made to provide an accurate account, some discrepancies may arise. I'd like to acknowledge the following resources. Art T. Burton, author of Black Gun, Silver Star, The Life and Legend of Frontier Marshal Bass Reeves, Race and Ethnicity in the American West, Indian Territory, Descriptive, Biographical, and Genealogical by D.C. Gideon, Dr. Jesse by Colonel Charles W. Mooney, Bass Reeves, Deputy United States Marshal, ArtBurton.com Doctor in Bell Star Country by Charles W. Mooney Wikipedia.org Kathy Weiser Alexander and the Legends of America website, LegendsOfAmerica.com Thanks to all our listeners and supporters for making this podcast a part of your day. We truly appreciate having you along for the ride. In the month of January, our modest, homemade, little old podcast exceeded 10,000 downloads. We also nearly doubled our listenership in one single month. We cannot express our thanks and gratitude enough. If you're hearing this message, you are the reason we met these goals thank you for being a part of our show. Many good people have become part of our show by lending their voices, and I'd like to say thanks to the cast and crew at Audio Oblivious Productions for their contributions to our show. A big round of applause to the following folks who appeared in this episode. Austin Beach, who played the parts of Colonel Charles W. Mooney, an Indian Territory pioneer. Scott Phillips, who played the Big Texan, Mike Jansen, who played the first stuck steer cowboy and the first newspaper voice. Jeremy Hennessy, who played the second stuck steer cowboy. Drew Prophet, who played the second newspaper voice. And our very own Cheryl Blizzen, who played the parts of Sandy Sturdivant and Alice Spann. I played the role of narrator, author D.C. Gideon, outlaw Jim Webb, Fronterhauser's first interview subject, and Bass Reeves. Are you interested in lending your voice to our show? Send us an email at driftandramble at gmail.com. That's driftandramble at gmail.com for details on becoming a voice actor. 
Want to support our show in other ways? Check out our Patreon page at patreon.com slash drift and ramble. We could really use your support. You may have noticed this episode was commercial free. Well, I have a confession to make. We never had a paying advertiser. All of the commercials we've run so far have been free. That means we've not received one single dime from any of the advertisers you may have heard on this show. We've got the full story posted on our Patreon page, where you can go to get some great behind-the-scenes info, as well as insider info on our plans for future shows. If you can spare $1 to support our show, head over to patreon.com slash driftandramble, and you'll get access to stuff like program notes and stickers when they become available. If you can spare $5, you'll get access to exclusive content and other goodies. You'll help support our show, and you will be the reason we stay commercial free. We love getting feedback from our listeners, so let us hear from you. We feature a review or two in each episode, so please go to iTunes or Stitcher and let us know what you think. Today's review is by Calum from The Rollist Pod on iTunes. Five stars. You're sitting at your desk reviewing yet another Excel spreadsheet. Yet, unbeknownst to your colleagues, you long for the Great West. For a world full of outlaws, trappers, and coyotes howling under a starlit sky, look no more. The Drift and Ramble podcast will bring you a regular injection of campfire Old West stories to lighten your commutes and long work days. Your secret will be safe from your employer, who will remain puzzled by your taste for boot spurs and straight out of the tin can baked beans. I'd like to thank the Pottern family for welcoming our podcast into the family and for helping us reach new listeners. How does it work? Just search the Pottern family hashtag or follow us on Twitter, and you'll be introduced to other family members with podcasts ranging from full-cast audio dramas to comedy, movie reviews, full-tilt sci-fi geekdom, and everything in between. Until we meet again, I'm Steve Blizzen. See you at the next installment of the Drift and Ramble podcast. The Drift and Ramble podcast is a Clear Voice Media production.